How many of you were at the festival? Really? You just came for the talk? Good, that's wonderful. But the festival was a huge success, especially if you love kids, because there were kids everywhere. I want to welcome you to the really the first live MAPS presentation in three years. We'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, it's certainly, well, in fact, let's do this. And we have to be patient. You know how long that took me? Yeah. <laughs> One of the logical questions you might want to ask at the end is, is, is there such a thing as a gigantosaurus? So keep that in mind. We are very fortunate tonight to have Tara with us. I think it's Le Pore. Not poor, but she'll take either. This is the MAPS committee, the committee that organizes this series of science talks that's intended to raise the level of science literacy in our area. Uh, I want to give special kudos to the, the woman at the top, Catherine Tripp, who organized the festival. Is Catherine here yet? She's probably busy cleaning up, but anyway. Uh, if you see her, thank her because the festival would not have been possible without her. And also, sitting up here, Dave Menchu, who will introduce the speaker, is some of, there he is, over, one of the best science teachers in Modesto. And I noticed his kids, he, he trains kids, well, he teaches kids uh, to do hands on science, and his tables were busy the whole night, with, backed up behind the table. So if any of his students are here, Thank you, uh, Enoch students. Are you here, Enoch? No? Okay. Cleaning up, I guess. A couple of them. Anyway, the whole committee does this voluntarily and does a great job. I'm going to skip a couple here. Okay, this is the map schedule for the semester. Please note that about four weeks from tonight, we have a, an exceptional talk on, excuse me, on uh, the Webb Telescope, and the speaker, Dr. Nirenberg, uh, actually has time allotted to her on the telescope. I don't know if it will happen before the talk, but she's going to talk about the telescope results and dark matter. Uh, so obviously that's something none of us know anything about, because I don't think anybody knows anything about it, but she's going to talk about what we do know about dark matter. Two months from tonight, actually it's not two months, a little bit less because of Thanksgiving, we have a program on butterflies. And he's from the Monterey Bay Aquarium. It should be really good. Pay attention to the publicity on this. Late tonight, they are scheduled for 4 and 7.30, but we might rethink how we do that in the future. We'll see. And then there's one on biomanufacturing and so on, on December 9th to end the semester. And next event, well, the, the one on, in November has an art contest for kids on monarch butterflies. Next semester we do start off with climate change, kind of an important topic. 
followed by a physics show in the auditorium for all ages. And March is open, but April it will. Is Jeanette here? There you are. Jeanette Pirlo is a brand new professor from San State, and she will talk, I guess, about mastodons. Is that right? Something like that. Okay, we also have a science colloquium that you're free to come to on Wednesday afternoons at 3.15. Uh, they're about every other week, every third week, and those are the topics. Tomorrow at the Car Museum, if you haven't been there, neither have I actually, but um, there's an international fair, there'll be dancing, music, and then, unfortunately, somebody named Dr. Alchemist, who happens to be me, and I don't know how I got into this Thing. But anyway, I'll be doing some demos. Uh, it's essentially the 100th anniversary of MJC has just ended, I believe. Uh, these four dignitaries have been at some of the events today. Any of them here tonight? Uh, oh, Dr. Brian Sanders. Back there in the back is the Vice President of Instruction. And we owe thanks to these people because they enable us to run these programs. They support us. yourself. And our speaker tonight will be introduced by Dave Menchu, one of the outstanding science teachers in Modesto. So Dave, you want to take it from here and we've got to change the program. You know how to do it? Not at all. I think our, our tech person in the back. Oh, well, I think she can. Anyway. So good evening and welcome to the Modesto Area Partners in Science presentation for September 2022. It's great to have you here with us and I see that a few of you already uh, attended the earlier event and we thank you for being there. We're really blessed to have a facility like Great Valley Museum and Modesto Junior College. So again, thank you for supporting us. Uh, tonight's speaker, Tara Lepore, comes to us with a wide ranging experience in not only dinosaurs, but also through her own excellent path of study. Tara holds an MS in Biology from the University of Massachusetts, an MS in Museum and Field Studies from the University of Colorado, as well as an MS in Science Education from Montana State University, and anticipates completion of her PhD in Integrated Biology from the University of California, Berkeley in 2024. Tara has an excellent understanding of high school science teaching as well because she's the Science Laboratory Manager for Web Schools in Claremont, California. She's also a graduate student instructor instructor at the University of California, Berkeley. Tara has won numerous awards and grants, including some of the following. A Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, two Geological Society of America awards, a Colorado University Museum of Natural History award, and an honor for her field work from Earthwatch and Millipore Corporation. She is the author of numerous published papers and donates a significant amount of her time to community service and has been an invited speaker on science for a host of organizations all over the United States. We are most fortunate to have Tara with us as our speaker tonight, and I ask you to join me in welcoming soon to be Dr. Tara Lepore. Love dinosaurs so much. So 
the version of the talk I'm giving tonight, I really want to know what drives you? What are you passionate about? And then maybe as we go along our journey tonight, we'll think a little bit about why do we all gravitate towards these amazing creatures, whether they're dinosaurs or other ancient animals, ancient plants, ancient worlds. Um, it's a little bit like we have a window in science fiction, and it's really science reality. So um, oh, this is what I'm looking for. So, so um, but I'll be the first to say that I don't know everything. Nobody does. And, uh, you know, I hope as we talk tonight, as I share some of my story with you, that you can also see a bit of yourself in that story. And I just want to be able to help and provide whatever information I can to help you on your own journey. So my name, my name, my whole name is Carmina Lafore, and um, my family is originally from Italy, and I grew up in the Boston area. Um, so if you've ever heard, like in the movie Departed, everybody like Matt Damon and uh, all of them, they all pack their car, you know, whatever. That's literally everyone in my family, um, and we're big fans of like the Red Sox and pizza. So, yeah, just don't talk to me about the New York Yankees, okay? And if you like the Yankees, it's okay, we can still be friends. Um, but I go by Tara, that's um, my nickname, and I'm still in school. I'm like kind of a perpetual student at this point, even though, um, like Dave mentioned, I've had a number of jobs and positions. And I know all of those jobs and positions and titles like sound really fancy, but my whole life, I've really just been trying to do something I'm passionate, passionate about because I love dinosaurs. <laughs> so um, let's get into this. What are we learning together today? What is our dialogue about today? Well, I started getting into this a little already. I want to talk about who am I, but I also want to learn who you are. And so this will be a little bit interactive. I hope it won't be too painful. Um, and especially for the younger folks earlier, I was talking about what is a paleontologist. Now, many of you might know what a paleontologist is, but just to lay the framework, um, I'll just briefly mention what that is. What is a fossil? Again, sort of for our younger audience, um, but just the basics here. Um, if you've ever wondered what is it that makes a dinosaur a dinosaur, uh, I'll talk briefly about that. Sort of, you can think of it as, a, as the dinosaur family tree. How do we know who is related to who? You know, getting back to this question, the title of the talk, why do we love dinosaurs so much? Um, you know, and if we stop and think about it, we can even imagine the, and think about the first time we ever saw a dinosaur in a book, or a movie, or a show, and it captured our imagination. Um, what sorts of fossils do I study? So I'd love to talk to you all about my journey to get to do what I do today. And it's really not too different from any other type of job. Um, but I hope to convince you that it's really fun. <laughs> and again, coming back to the title of our talk, okay, so why do we love dinosaurs so darn much? What is it about them? Um, and throughout that kind of centerpiece, I hope to inspire you in some small way that this love of dinosaurs we have as people ties into something fundamental, fundamental about who we are as human beings. And it connects us as people to our past and to our planet's past. And then there'll be some time for questions and answers, and I promise you can ask me anything. Seriously. That's not about the New York name. So, um, hi, I'm Tara. And these are just some pictures of me mostly squinting at things <laughs> like rocks and books and notebooks. And um, I just put these up there um, because for a long time, I didn't think I was gonna be able to do the work that I do. And sometimes I just like, to sit and think about 
my gosh, you know, I've gotten to go to these places. And I mostly got to go out into these kind of wide open spaces and do this squinting at rocks and squinting at books and learning about fossils and finding fossils. Um, because I, I asked a lot of people for help along the way. And I had to figure out how to do that. Um, you'll notice something about some of these spaces anyway, is that they're big, open, wide spaces. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be totally real with you all. Um, I have something called agoraphobia. It's a type of a panic disorder. Um, but I really don't think of it so much as a disorder as I do a part of myself. What people who have agoraphobia feel is really uncomfortable in big open spaces. So you can probably imagine how I felt as a little kid really wanting to go out and like learn about these dinosaurs and these other things that I was seeing in all these books and movies. But I knew I had to go out somewhere like that. And I also didn't know who to ask to get there. And even if I did, I was super scared that I wasn't going to be able to do it. But I mention all of that because here I am in front of a big room of people talking to you all, having done some of these things. And I just want to recognize it's not easy sometimes to follow your dreams and your passions. And there will be people who say along the way that you can't do it. But believe me, if I can do it, I promise you you can too. And I know that sounds really kind of wishy-washy, but I'm living proof. Um, the picture in the lower uh, left-hand side where I'm like scribbling in a notebook, um, I'm 16 years old in that picture, and I almost didn't go to do that opportunity because I was so just convinced that my brain wasn't going to let me handle it. But I, I, I got on a plane by myself, was able to go out across the country and camp outside. So I mention all of those things because even relatively young people, you know, if we get the chance to, to push our boundaries, um, sometimes it's, it's better to do that than to, to regret that you, you had tried. So who else am I? I promise I won't just talk about me this whole time. Um, but I really want to tell you about my familia, okay? This is my family, and, and I say familia because we're a big Italian family. Um, we're from the U.S., but um, our culture is very, very Italian. Uh, we're from Sicily, which is in the south of Italy. So um, besides pizza, we eat a lot of calamari and all kinds of stuff that comes from the ocean, mostly fish. Uh, but this is my dad and my sister. And that's my cat. Her name is Obsidian, oh. like the black lava rock. Um, and she's a little butthead. Um, and uh, the person dancing in the middle there with parsley is my mama. And on the right hand side is my wife, Jessie, who is right here. She's also my cheerleader. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah so that's my family. Um, and I put some other things at the top just to represent a little bit more about who I am as well. So this was, to be honest, a little bit more about for the kids earlier. I was asking them different questions like, do a thumbs up if you like ice cream. And that's fine. We're all big kids at heart, right? So give me a thumbs up if you like ice cream. Okay, any of you who don't have your thumbs up, don't talk to me. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, so, um, give me a thumbs up if you feel like at some point in your life you had to overcome something. Yeah. Give me a thumbs up if at some point in your life somebody told you no and you did the thing anyway. <laughs> Maybe not always with good, uh, good results. Um, give me a thumbs up if sometime in the last week or so, something brought you joy. Maybe you can't picture. Yeah, you can't picture how you see that for me. Um, give me a thumbs up, please, if you feel like these last three years of the pandemic have been 
making you really create community. I know for me. Um, so without the chance to sit and talk and chat with all of you, I just wanted to get a sense of how we're all doing. You know, because even as scientists, even as paleontologists, if we don't talk about who we are as people, then we're not doing our full job. I really believe that. I think that's where we need to go as a field. So again, some of the stuff from earlier I was talking about paleontologists, what is that? I also love that Lego has made like Lego paleo people. Man, where was that in the 90s? Oh, I'm looking all over that. But here's a little Lego person. I love that it seems to be female identifying, digging up something like a shell. Um, so I'm a paleontologist, and again, apologies if this is really basic, but um, I'm a person who studies the Earth's past, the ancient past, and I just ask questions. And that's something a lot of us grew up doing, like every day. Like, anybody in here have like a like two or three year old, or know a two or three year old, or what asking why? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why. Why not? Well, why, why don't you know? <laughs> so it's like that, but it never goes away. And that is the adult, like, Pokemon morph of a scientist. Um, so um, I also talked earlier about what is a fossil. So again, forgive me if it's a little basic. But there are a few main types of fossils, just talking about setting the stage for the kind of work that I do. So fossils can be these remains of ancient life. They can be bones as a type of remain. They can also be footprints. And for a good chunk of my time, um, after I got used to doing the field work and being out and doing this kind of work a little bit more, uh, I started working on dinosaur footprints. So when I did my my undergraduate degree at the University of Massachusetts, I went and mapped some dinosaur tracks in uh, Holyoke, Massachusetts. I don't know if anyone's familiar with Western Massachusetts, maybe a couple, yeah. So that in Holyoke, um, down by the train tracks, next to the highway, with like a bunch of graffiti everywhere, and I'm out there like mapping my dinosaur tracks. I felt like, you know, the world's most urban Indiana Jones. And I also thought I'm down by the train tracks, so if like you know somebody tossed my body over, there's fine. I'm just down by the tracks, whatever. Uh, so, <laughs> but these dinosaur tracks were amazing, and it didn't matter to me where they were. What mattered to me was that they told a story, and these dinosaur tracks told the story of animals dancing around on a mud flat 210 million years ago, and they told even more of a story in that case than any bones had told. Because they were telling about these animals while they were still alive. And that, I thought that was really, really profound. They made a lot of friends too, they come out and hang out. And the last type of fossil I want to talk to you all about is this. Now, I did not personally work on this particular specimen, but my former advisor did, and this is an enormous piece of Tyrannosaur crap, <laughs> which, believe it or not, is a type of fossil. So, if you ever aspire to great things in life, just remember that you too can grow up to study dinosaur poop. My parents are extremely proud. Um, but honestly, dinosaur droppings, droppings in general, I'll talk about what the scientific word is for them in just a few minutes, are amazing. And not only do they preserved remarkably well. But this zebra looking bar with the black and white is about the size of my hand from my pinky, pinky to my thumb. And that's just that scale bar. That's a pretty big poop, <laughs> but massive. So we know from where this was found, where that rock formation would have been, so the geology of where it was found that it was in a place where the biggest thing that would have made a poop like that, that lived on land, and that also ate meat, 
because that thing's chock full of bone, would have been a Tyrannosaurus Rex. So most likely, Tyrannosaurus Duty, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Um, honestly, amazing though, um, and I'll talk about why shortly. Earlier I was talking with some folks uh, in the younger audience about how do we know what is a dinosaur and what isn't. Um, those of you in here who've been taking maybe some geology, biology classes, maybe you, you super love dinosaurs, maybe you can notice a pattern even if you haven't done any of those things or taken any of those classes, maybe you can notice a pattern between the left-hand side and the right-hand side of these two different groups of animals. So take a look. Do you notice anything that might categorize the left-hand side and the right-hand side? And for the ones that are skeletons, you can imagine them with their skin and bones by their skin and their muscles. Any ideas? What's that? Hey, yeah, so some of them on, you think, the left-hand side appear to be mostly bipedal. And we've got this little bird here, too. That's not a mistake. Yeah, they're bipeds. They walk on two legs like us. Except for that beautiful long-necked dinosaur walking on all fours. Okay, it's a great observation. That's part of it. Um, what do we notice about the right-hand side? Hey, yeah, I love that too. So on the right-hand side, what you're noticing are bony protrusions kind of sticking out of many of the creatures on the right-hand side. That's a great observation. Um, what do you think bony protrusions like that might be used for? I heard defense and defense. Anything else? Make, maybe mating or like fighting. I love that idea. What else might animals, like even animals today, use protrusions and worms and things for? We heard defense. Yes, attracting mates. I like that a lot. We've heard defense, attracting mates, fighting. Yeah. Any other comments? Yeah. Yeah. I like that a lot too. On some of them, they might have horns that could be for digging or for some other purpose that we could hypothesize. Yeah, I like that. Well, these are two different family groups, if you can think of them like a big family tree. Two enormous family groups of dinosaurs. And they're categorized, there's some debate over should this categorization change, but they're categorized in the classic way based on their case. So if we think back to those animals on the left-hand side, right, even the long-necked dinosaurs, they have hips that are shaped like the ones above the letter C. So, these hips. Whereas the ones on the right hand side, they have hips that are shaped more like the letter D. So these hips don't lie. <laughs> but really, this is how way back in the 1800s, dinosaurs began to be classified based on morphological features, based on features of their skeleton, the shape and form of their skeleton, especially their hips. So we call these C dinosaurs, the C-shaped hips, theropods and sauropods. And we call the D-shaped hips all the other plant eaters. So all of those spiky, thorny, horned dinosaurs, and the vast majority are plant eaters there. So the theropods are all of the meat eaters, to our knowledge. Even some of the weird theropods that might have been plant eaters secondarily. The vast majority of theropods were meat-eating carnivores. And the relatives, the sauropods, have this funny hip shape. So now if anybody ever asks you on the street and they come up to you and they say, hey, do you know why a dinosaur is a dinosaur? The first thing that you can tell them is, 
why are you talking to me? And then you can tell them, oh, it's something about their hips. And so this is what we use to differentiate between the two types of skeletons, the two really big family trees of dinosaurs. We call the top group, the theropods and sauropods, sauriscian dinosaurs. And I know it's a little bit like kindergarten, but please humor me and I'm going to say it once. You can walk out of here and be like, I know the two names and two groups of dinosaurs. The top group is sauriscian. Sauriscian. Woo, one more time. Sauriscian. Sauriscian. Oh, like it chills. And the bottom group is ornithischian. Ornithischian. One more time. Ornithischian. Ornithischian. Thank you so much. Yes, yes, I feel the power. Um, so um, thanks for participating uh, in my little game. But really, uh, these two groups are the two big branches of the dinosaur family tree. Okay. Um, while we're on the topic of what is a dinosaur, remember we're trying to think about why we love dinosaurs so, so much. We have to know what they are um, and what they aren't. So who, who recognizes, just a show of hands, who recognizes some of these animals up here? Like, oh, yeah, I think I've seen them. I've seen them around. Yeah. Does anyone know what this creature is with the sail on its back? Oh, I heard it. Uh, yeah. The metrodon. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes its relatives call it dimetrodon. I don't know which one it prefers. Dimetrodon, dimetrodon. A uh, really cool thing about this animal, Dimetrodon, is that it is more closely related to us as human beings than it is to, to the T-Rex. So it's on the lineage heading towards mammals. And I like to think of that every day when I feel like really gross and tired. And, oh man, I can't, I can't do it, I'm too tired. Then I think I've got a Dimetrodon inside of me, baby. So I love that this animal is so closely related, relatively speaking, Two mammals, to us. So, um, the other creatures we have on the bottom left and the top right, really famous mosasaurs, featured in the Jurassic World movies, and pliosaurs and plesiosaurs, marine reptiles. And you can think of them as kind of cousins of dinosaurs, but more closely related to different kinds of reptilian lizards than to two dinosaurs. Anybody know the flying one? I heard pterodactyl. Does anyone know the other name, like the pterosaur? Uh, who said pteranodon? Yeah, yeah. So it is a pterosaur. That's like the name of the group. And its specific name is pteranodon. Yeah. The pterodactyl is close. It's like a, a cousin of Pteranodon. Yeah, sadly that's not a dinosaur either. So you walk out of here and you remember nothing else besides Sauriscia. And what was the other one? Or Ornithischia? Yeah, Ornithischia. Then Pteranodon is not a dinosaur. Sorry everyone. So let's go back to our topic here. You know, before we get too much into the weeds, thinking about all of these terms. Why do we love dinosaurs so much? Did you notice there's a dinosaur up here? <laughs> this is our mascot, Carolyn. Thank you so much for bringing Shorty. Shorty's here. I know Shorty's like, I don't know where I am right now. I don't know what's going on. But Shorty, you might have remembered I put a bird on the theropod side of the dinosaurs, the theropod sauropod group, the sauriscians. Shorty here is a Sauriscian dinosaur. Well, that's pretty wild. Next time you have a chicken sandwich, you know, that's kind of the taste of delicious, delicious T Rex cousin. Sorry, Shorty. Um, we love you. But it really brings it home, right? We live with these animals every day. We're living in a world that's changing. What responsibility do we have in this knowledge? of our place in the world, and these amazing creatures, some of which are still around and still with us. So why do we love dinosaurs so much? Um, some people will say to you, not me, I like dinosaurs. 
with the little kids. I only like some dinosaurs. Those are like kind of this semi-dinosaur fan. Uh, some, rightfully so, might say, you know, I think dinosaurs are a little too scary, especially the little ones. That's okay. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten questions about Megalodon, Parker and I'm not Megalodon, the, the giant shark, amazing creature, not a dinosaur. Cool animal. Wait, I thought dinosaurs were just like in movies and stuff. Yeah, they're in movies, but they're also real. Whoa. Again, why do we love them? Oh, you like Dinosaur Train or Barney? Oh man, my little sister loved Barney. I think I've seen every episode. And then I just like pretended to so, like be cool about it. I was like, no, 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 I'm the big sister. But I watch every episode. Yeah. <laughs> it taught me how to share. So, you know, I don't have to tell y'all, we've seen dinosaurs in so much media, in so many movies. Um, you know, the good dinosaur, y'all see that one? And then Ice Age, dinosaur, Disney dinosaur. I thought it was kind of fun back in like the early 2000s, I um, Rex from Boy Story, I mean, I love Rex. <laughs> My personal favorite, y'all see them for time. Oh, if you haven't seen it, it's a heartbreaker. It's so good. And, fun fact, there's a Great Valley in them for time. Great Valley, museum. Great Valley. I'm just saying, I mean, there's some overlap there, for sure. Beautiful movie. And, of course, the Jurassic World movies, the Jurassic Park movies. Um, I know that these have brought so much inspiration to people. Um, we want to hear stories about dinosaurs over and over. We want to think about them and what it means to be people in a world where these creatures existed, and maybe some of them still do, in the form of birds. Um, so look, pause, and think. You don't have to, you know, I'm not going to make you turn and talk and shake hands and anything, but pause and think. Why are dinosaurs so interesting to so many people? Why are they so interesting? What do they make us think about? I'd love for you to just consider for a second, if you like dinosaurs, why do you like them? What's so special about fossils? What do they make us feel? Can you think of the first time you ever heard about dinosaurs, maybe as a kid, or maybe in a class, or from a friend, or maybe this is the first time tonight you've ever heard about dinosaurs. I was good. By the way, this funny looking statue is from a place called the Crystal Palace in England. Um, it just looks really funny. It's what people thought dinosaurs looked like about 200, 250 years ago. So, uh, yeah. We've come, we've come a long way. <laughs> um, oh, this is, yeah, just another question here. Who do you know who likes dinosaurs? Um, because part of the reason why I included this slide is really to get us to think about why dinosaurs matter to us and why they matter so darn much to people in general. Like, what does a dinosaur have to do with building community? What does a dinosaur have to do with increasing our mental health? What does a dinosaur have to do about inspiring us to follow our dreams? About embracing change, because we know that even if things change, they're never truly lost. Wow, we got real deep. <laughs> um, so let's hold those questions, right? You know, again, why, why are these animals so interesting? Why do we like them? How do we build community even with them? All those questions with us. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about what I do. Okay. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit more about what I do because, um, you know, I mentioned way back when I was 16 and I was having like massive panic attacks figure out what is my place in this world. I don't have money to go and do these things. And you know, things were kind of rough in my home life. And I 
I felt simultaneously like I could never leave my home, but also like if I didn't, I'd never go and do all the paleo stuff that I was thinking about. I mean, I really wrestled with those questions. So I, I tell that to all of you, just so you know, when I show you these other pictures, it's not like I waltz in and like, oh yeah, I, have this. I, I know all the answers. Um, so I talked to you earlier about poop. <laughs> And the scientific word for fossil poop is a coprolite. I also study in my current program fossil teeth. Amazing, super cool little time capsules of information they are. And I, I still love those fossil footprints. Take me back to Holyoke, Massachusetts. Uh, but what is a coprolite? We have a little bit of a Greek lesson. So if you know the Greek language, um, it's used often to build scientific words. And if, if you walk out of here with just nothing other than Sarithia, Ornithischia, why do we like dinosaurs? And the word for, for fossil poop, it is coprolite. The Greek word kopros for poop, and lithos for light, for stone. So coprolite is literally a poop stone. It's one of my favorite things in the world to get an entire room of people. I don't, I don't care how old you are to, to just yell over the poop stone. So please, please, please humor me. Um, proper light means what? Poop stone. Like, yes, poop stone. That'll keep you awake. <laughs> poop stone, yes. So I love copper lights and other kinds of fossils because of the stories they can tell us. Real stories based in this window into an ancient world, right? But coprolites are amazing. They can tell us about diet. They can tell us about behavior. How many animals were pooping at the same time, or at least why were they pooping so much? That's a real question I thought about. Um, why were they pooping so much? And um, the environment around those animals, uh, which I'll demonstrate here. Oh, yeah. Um, like I say, my, my parents are pooping. So this is just a little bit of an idea of what you can study when it, when it comes to fossil droppings. Um, you might notice that on one side here, on this left-hand side, these are pieces of fossil dropping. They're copper lights. And they have these kind of swirly shapes in them. Can you see those OK? They, they look almost like cinnamon buns. They're not cinnamon buns. <laughs> They're very tiny. If you see the white bars here, the white bar indicates one millimeter. One millimeter is just about as long as my, my fingernail, the white part that I probably should cut. So it's not very big at all. And these are very small snails in the droppings of a plant-eating dinosaur that my former advisor found. And Wow, like this is evidence that even back in the Cretaceous period, 70 to 80 million years ago, snails were churning around that poop, got stuck in there, and now they're part of the fossil record. Um, and it turns out some snails do this today. They'll feed off of fresh dung from herbivores. It's amazing to think about what kind of snapshot of information get from fossil droppings. So the other one here is not from a dinosaur at all on the right hand side. It's actually from after the dinosaurs in what you might want to think of as the age of mammals, but it's after the big asteroid impact that wiped out most of the dinosaurs with the exception of birds. And it says here leptomeryx bone. If you notice in the very center of those spheres of poop, there is a toe bone. That toe bone is from a little, kind of like a deer-like creature called the Pomerix. And uh, we believe that this toe bone and this poop came from an animal very like a crocodile or alligator. The reason being, crocs and alligators today have such an acidic stomach that really cool studies have been done where they'll feed a crocodile or alligator uh, a rat, say, and then they'll take an x-ray every few hours and watch the bones of that rat completely dissolve. 
So if this food could have come from a crocodile or alligator, um, the etching of acid on that bone and the lack, relative lack of other complete bones could be an indicator of, forgive me, who dung it, <laughs> right? Yeah, I know, I'll be here all week otherwise. <laughs> I know, missed out on my second career. Uh, so I also want to show with you, this is something that, um, you know, actually I haven't published papers, I'm like, uh, I've published uh, abstracts for papers and abstracts for talks. Um, um, but uh, one particular project that I'm, I've been working on for a really long time is this super secret folk science where uh, this is from a Tyrannosaur dropping. And I took these little pieces of Tyrannosaur poop, stuck them into a fancy microscope, a scanning electron microscope, and the black and white picture that you see on the right looks almost like bumpy, maybe a little bit like skin, or maybe even a seed or something like that, some kind of strawberry or something. We don't know what it is, but we know that these poops, these tyrannosaur droppings, are incredibly good at preserving impressions. And I think that's really exciting. It's like, does anyone remember silly putty? It's like silly putty, where you slap the silly putty down, and you peel it away, and there's stuff stuck to it, like the image of something. That is very much what Tyrannosaur Popolites um, seem to do. Um, I'm happy to talk more about the chemical composition and why we think that happens. Um, but for now, just enjoy this beautiful impression of mystery, who silly putty image. <laughs> Um, so, fast forward from my work on droppings, um, after, when I was 16, after starting to wrestle with my panic attacks, after, you know, saving up enough money to move out to Colorado and do the work of the poop, um, I taught high school after my master's degree with the poop work. I taught high school for seven years in Houston, Texas and in Los Angeles area and loved doing it, absolutely loved it. But I realized during my time as a teacher that what I, what I had a better idea about was if I went to do a PhD, if I decided that was something for me, I knew that I wanted to take my education and my experience, my education um, experience as a teacher and my own Self. Like, what does it mean to be a disabled person? What does it mean to be neurodiverse? What does it mean to have panic attacks? And I wanted to merge those things together in a PhD. And so I, I ended up talking to a, a potential advisor who said, heck yes, you can do that. And that's the kind of person, if you're interested in grad school, that you want to talk to, who's going to embrace your whole self and say, heck yes, I'm going to support you in doing that. So I'm happy to talk more if you have questions about all of that good stuff. But now, fast forward to 2019, you know, I left teaching high school and I moved from LA with my wife and said, hey, let's move to Berkeley. That's, that's not very expensive, right? <laughs> um, so, yeah, so, you know, we're, we're making it work, we're making it work, um, you know, and, and uh, so now I'm over at UC Berkeley and I've got some dinosaurs you know, in my lobby of the, of the building where I work. One thing we don't have is a, a public-facing museum. We do have plenty of resources online. And that's not to bash you, you think they're doing wonderful work. But it's hard to get inside. And that's something that I feel is kind of an allegory for a lot of academia. It's hard to get inside. And so, what I wanted to do, I, if, I, if I came back to do a PhD, I wanted to do more than just do my science. I wanted to try and help more people get inside, you know, and, and stay there and feel welcome and not want to leave. And if they did, that's great, but not because they felt they were in a toxic environment. So what you're seeing here are some pictures of me doing work with, this is actually, remember left homerix? So left, left homerix tooth. Yeah, I'm starting to slice up their teeth now, these poor animals, they don't like me. But it's a really beautiful little tooth. 
Uh, you can see the enamel up at the top looks like kind of three peaks of a mountain range. Um, this is just me kind of being goofy at one of our annual meetings of the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology, where we get together and talk about paleontology stuff. Um, and this is an enormous um, model of a giant squid-like creature called an ammonite. And that's the real size of the animal, even though it's a model. So I mentioned calamari earlier, you know, like the little rings of squid. Yeah, I just, I just can't even imagine how much calamari you can make from a squid that size. It's actually intimidating. Um, but one of the things I'm most um, proud about and happy about when I'm doing this work um, is that I also get to share it with, with my sister. And my sister and I both identify as disabled, although we're disabled and, and neurodiverse in different ways. My sister has intellectual disabilities. Um, when she went through school, they called it special needs. When I went through school, they called it gifted. So I just want to let you sit with that for a second. Words that we use matter. They matter. Uh, my sister's incredible. Her name's Katrina. And she is now a bona fide co-presenter, um, co-author on this abstract, uh, all about how to bring more people with neurodiverse backgrounds and disabilities into the work we're doing. And not just because it looks good, and not just because the science will be better, but because it's the right thing to do. And maybe in doing so, we'll kind of crack open that door a little more, and crack it open a little more, so we rebuild the whole system. That's kind of my, my road dream anyway. And I want to give a shout out to Jeanette Perlow, who's sitting in the front over here and helped organize this whole uh, session. So we're trying to have those conversations. Ah, yeah, yeah. Wouldn't have done it without you, though, Jeanette, for real. Now, this is just what I mean here is community. Remember how I mentioned, like, what can a dinosaur teach us? about community? What can a fossil teach us about ourselves, about our connection to this planet? And for goodness sake, we shouldn't have to change who we are just to study the thing we want to study. Um, I'm almost finished with my talk, so I just want to wrap up talking about um, some other collaborations that are really meaningful uh, and important to me. Um, there are beautiful places all around the world that have fossils. And not everybody who lives in those places gets to do the work with the fossils that are right in their backyards. And that doesn't sound super great, but the nice thing is there are people in some of those places working to make things different. And my, my amazing friends in, in Mongolia, these are Mongolian paleontologists here. Um, Mongolia is north of China, south of Russia. If you've ever heard of Genghis Khan, that was his place, and in fact, most of Eurasia was his place at one point. Um, but the space that you're seeing at the top, that vista, is a beautiful location called the Flaming Cliffs. The Flaming Cliffs in Mongolian is Uthman Edek. I'm learning a little. If you speak Mongolian, please correct me. Um, Uthman Edek means red cliffs. It's also known as Bayanzak or the place of the Zag plant, the Zag for the scrubby plant. So Bayan Zag for Urban Eric. And um, I'm holding the skull of a, well, it's a model, a printed model, of a very famous animal that was discovered for the first time ever in the 1920s, the Western science, at Urban Eric, at the Flaming Cliffs. Does anyone know what this animal is? I know it's a little hard to see. Give you a hint, it's really, really famous from Jurassic Park. It's Velociraptor, yeah. So Velociraptor was found for the first time at the Flaming Cliffs in the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. But there are people there now, young kids, teachers, who simply do not know, other than maybe some stories told by sheep herders and things. They don't know that people have been coming in 
from Western countries taking their fossils for many generations until the work of Mongolian scientists, like some of my friends, started to break down those barriers and say, hey, we need to teach our own people here how to craft their own journey to paleontology. So that's what this work is. Um, Mongolia is a fantastic country. Um, it's, if you're vegan or vegetarian, um, it's, it's not very easy. Um, I've never eaten more sheep meat in my life, but it's a wonderful place um, with beautiful people. And uh, yeah, um, I guess what I'm trying to say is going all the way back to like 16 year old me that was afraid of big open spaces to get on a plane and do this. Um, you know, I was scared. I'll admit it. I was scared more than once on several days, not because of the people there, they were lovely, um, but because I was waiting for that moment where I would finally realize that I couldn't do it. You know, even after all these years. Like something's gonna stop me now. And I just want to really hit that home because um, it's like that Queen song, you know, Don't Stop Me Now. <laughs> I feel like that's sometimes the soundtrack uh, to many of our lives. Um, better to try, if you can, and have the opportunity, than to, than to pass it up in regret. Okay, so all of this is well and good, but why do we love dinosaurs so much? To wrap up our talk tonight, why do we love them? I think, if you're asking me, it has something to do with the fact that they're like magical creatures. And they give us a window into these worlds that don't seem real. But like unicorns and like dragons, which by the way, dragons and unicorns may have been inspired by fossils, they inspire us to tell stories. They inspire us to look down at the ground, to look up at the sky, and say, why? What was that thing? Let me make a story about it. Let me connect to this other human being about it. Um, and maybe we'll feel a little less alone. So with that, I just want to encourage you all, follow your dreams. It's OK to be scared. You aren't alone. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you, and Jason.